Uh, good afternoon, guys. Welcome to uh, the continuation of our series of Android Talks. Uh, I've got Jacques Smats here. He's going to be talking about um, Rx Java, as simple and as simple and powerful as he can make it. Uh, just a quick bio about Jacques. He studied chemistry and then law before realizing his passion for development and especially Android development. As someone who had a hard time figuring out a lot out of the apparent simple concepts in programming, he has a passion for making the difficult things in Android as simple as possible. So welcome, Jacques. Uh, let's do your talk. Hi. OK, so you heard the introduction. I'm Jacques Smuts. Uh, this talk is mostly focused on Android, but I'll try and make it as generalizable as possible. Uh, so Oryx Java. Um, I split this thing into two parts, basically, or there's two goals of this talk. The one is to show how powerful Oryx Java is, which is difficult because it, there is a lot to it. And the other part is to show you how to get into Oryx Java. Like the, the hard part is, is to, to start using it. And once you start using it, it becomes a lot easier. Um, I think it's important to get into Oryx Java because of the simple fact that a lot of people are using it. A lot of libraries out there have Rx Java support added already. And if you don't know it and you read the Rx Java, you will not understand it. So you have to do a little bit of work to get into it. Uh, I am at Flat Circle. Uh, a lot of the code you are about to see and the examples I use are things that I learned at Flat Circle. Uh, so I have to give my thanks where give credit where credit is due. So what is Oryx Java? Oryx Java is the Java implementation of Reactive X. Reactive X is a framework for various languages, which implements the observer pattern uh, uh, and functional programming uh, upon languages that don't necessarily make that easy. Uh, so reactive programming and the observer pattern is something that requires a lot of explanation. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, that is something you should read up on. But the basic thing about reactive programming is normally you would go fetch data, you would tell your code to go do something, whereas reactive programming has a basic principle of your waiting. You, you have everything is always waiting for things to happen, for a server to send you info, you subscribe to server info, you wait for user inputs, that kind of thing. Uh, and in any UI, I think that is an important approach to take. Uh, but Oryx Java is difficult, so I've tried my best to make it as easy, as simple, as friendly as possible. Uh, but no matter how friendly I make it, most people are just going to respond like this. But is that a GIF not working? Oh, there we go. <laughs> so in case you were wondering, that, that, that was a cat. <laughs> um, and you will, you will probably respond like this the same way. That's, that's how I responded the first time. You, you see Oryx Java, you just walk around. Um, before I get into the code, I just want to get, uh, go through a list of things what I personally like about Oryx Java. If you read up about Oryx Java, you will see a lot of points that don't make a lot of sense, or you can see where they're coming from. But for me, these, these are the things that are useful to me right now in the code that I'm writing right now. So first off, uh, semi-automatic logging. Uh, the moment you put something into an Oryx Java chain, so anything that happens, the moment you put it into Oryx Java, it automatically, or almost automatically, becomes a bit of a try-catch. So anytime there's an error that would normally completely crash the app, now it just logs an error and then cancels that thing. Uh, so in the past, the QA team would get back to me and say, oh, if I press this button and then go back and then press this button, and they, then the app crashes. Now I don't get those reports anymore because of Oryx Java because they say, if I press this button and I go back and I do this thing, then the button no longer works, which is 
seems like not that, that big a deal and should be normally easy to do, but with RxJava, it's almost automatic. Uh, the second thing is the observer pattern. I've mentioned this already. It's a very nice change to know that the framework specifically caters for an app that is always waiting to serve the latest data and respond to the latest events from the user. Uh, Oryx Java makes thread switching easy. I know Kotlin coroutines was mentioned earlier. Kotlin coroutines is fantastic, and I think you should use that if you are on Kotlin. If you're not on Kotlin, Oryx Java is a little bit better. Um, but Kotlin coroutines is mostly for slightly simpler things. Uh, there's a lot more limitations. It's got a very specific use case, whereas Oryx Java has all of these other things, including thread switching. Uh, easier memory leak prevention. Now, memory leaks is, is it's more of a, a kind of a, a personal thing to me that it bothers me a lot if I'm not sure if I'm doing the memory handling correctly, the garbage collection, all of that. Uh, Oryx Java, it sets all of these listeners all over the app and handles it very effectively in memory. Uh, and finally, I can, I can understand all of those cool Android projects. But is my head too high? Can people see? Okay. Uh, but there are a lot of very interesting uh, Android projects out there, uh, and it's difficult to understand them if, um, if, you don't, if you don't understand Oryx Java. So I'm going to get into the code now. But before that, here are two links. Please go there. This is Google Play. I put the app on the Google Play Store. You can go download it. And this is the code for that app. Uh, I will use examples in this presentation about, uh, from this app, but you can play around for yourself as well to see what it's like. Uh, and inside the app is also a link to this, which is the GitHub repo hosting the code. Let me just call my nerves while you download. So the first example is the button rapid click activity. I know some of you are still downloading. The main thing that this does, uh, it's, it does two things. Every time you press the button, it makes a number go up. Fairly easy. Uh, but if you press a button very, very quickly, uh, it doesn't count the additional clicks. It, it kind of filters out the rapid clicks. Uh, so it, it waits a bit. So the main thing is that, and this is something, something I've I've had a QI department report to me several times, like, if I press this button quickly two times, it doesn't work right, or the screen opens twice, that kind of thing. So how would you go about doing that without Oryx Java? You put a timer in, you, different ways to do that. With Oryx Java, you can do it, no, I'm blocking out the code specifically, just look at the length of the code. It is very short. Does the, or everything you, do, you see there is just this code. So I'm just going to go through the code one by one. First off, you find the text view. You, it's this text view. You know how to do that if you know Android. And then Oryx view that clicks. Now, this is an uh, Android extension library which binds the clicks into an observable which emits items from this button that you pass to it. If some of those words don't make sense to you, don't worry. I will explain them. I'm mostly focusing on just showing how simple some of the code can be. Subscribe. This is the thing that gets the emission from these click events and decides what to do. Now, in this case, it's just going to set the text to 1, but we want it to tally up the amount. So to do that, we have to map the value. So this thing just passes a, an empty object. This could be anything. Now we're mapping it to one, and that one is passed down to subscribe, 
which sets it here. So again, this, this is just going to set one. We're not actually counting anything up. But RxJava has this nice function called scan. And what scan does is it keeps a, a kind of running total. You, it, it doesn't have to be a sum. You can do anything in there. But in our case, we just sum it up, pass the total down, and this thing sets a total. So now it's working the same as the screen. It just tallies up the total. Why would you go through all of that effort just for this simple thing? But it does allow other operations, such as if you press it rapidly, it doesn't, it forces it out. How would you do that without Oryx Java? You would set a timer, there's different ways. In this case, it's a one liner, throttle first. And all this does is every time it gets a signal, then for a thousand milliseconds after that, you will not get any additional signals passed down the chain. Now, I'm using the chain repeatedly here because this is something you need to get used to. This guy doesn't make a lot of sense to you quite yet, or you're not sure if you're on board yet, but this is how Rx Java code looks. It's always this chain going down of one thing, passing it down to the next, to the next, to the next. Uh, oh, and there's one other thing it can do is you can get... I think this thing is failing. There we go. Uh, the error, the timber is just the error logger. I pass it the, the error, and it logs it automatically. That's the, the try-catch I was talking about earlier. Um, OK. Uh, the reason I show it like this and with all of those lambdas is because if you go online and you look for the documentation, you will see that it's it's this much. It's like way too much for the screen because they don't use lambdas in the documentation, and you have to understand the code as much as possible to use the lambdas. But it doesn't look nice, and then you don't want to start using RxJava. You'll start using marble diagrams that look like this, like all of these examples. And then, okay, this one looks a bit better. You don't still don't understand what's going on there. Start reading up on RxJava. They talk about anamorphism versus catamorphism and imperative programming versus reactive. And again, the information just becomes a little bit too much. And then I just want you to, you just want a simple explanation. So I found the simplest way I can present this information is like this. You have an observable and an observer which emits things the observer observes the observable, and the observable emits things down. It does this basic animation. That is the core of RxJava. Like, and they took this simple concept and made it so complex, and they, they, they use other words, so like observable, or publisher, or emitter, or subject. It's also flowable. But it all comes down to the same thing. It's always this thing that passes it down to an observer. And those are the words you need to start keeping an eye out if you want to get into Rx Java. What is an observable? What is an observer? And what is an emission? And what do they mean by an emission? So I'm going to give, go back to the previous example and show you how this emission works. So I'm exploding the text here. And so what this does is the Rx view clicks at the top, creates an object observable which passes the object down to throttle first. Throttle first throttles out all of the thing, like in this case, a one second timer, takes it down to map. Map turns the object from a empty object into a one, passes this down to the scan function, and the scan function keeps a running total and gives this down to the result. Now, if you want to look at the documentation, you'll see something like this which, okay, so they call this a marble diagram, and if you want to get into Oryx Java, you need to eventually start to learn how to use this. But I found that oftentimes it's, it doesn't say that much because, okay, this one, okay, I get what you're saying if you emit a yellow one down, but then immediately in that there's a throttle, so the green one is not emitted. You know, it takes a lot of time to start understanding what they're trying to say. I mean, especially this one, like, 
what is going on there. And this is the official documentation. Uh, if you look at it long enough, you can start to get what they're going for, but if you don't already know what that is, you're not, not going to learn much. So I find that animations are better. I'm going to show, show this a few times. It's easy to miss. And again, like the throttle first, throttles it out, map turns it into an integer, scan keeps a running total, and passes it down to result. Like, and I know I I'm, I'm, I'm keep going on about the same thing here, because for me, it was very difficult to get into this whole thing where what is Oryx of? And like, you need to start thinking of everything in reactive programming in this way, of this, this thing that happens at the top, and then it's passing down the chain. See, this is a problem with animations. It breaks the presentation sometimes. There we go. So uh, just a quick aside, uh, I code in Kotlin. Uh, another th nice thing about Oryx Java is that the difference between Kotlin and, and Java is actually very, very small. Uh, oftentimes, if you're working in, in Oryx Java things in chains, uh, you don't immediately notice if it's in Kotlin or Java. So this is what the Kotlin code looks like. As you can see, it looks almost identical. The only difference is, you know, we we don't need to find the text view because it's, it's done by the Kotlin things. But the standard library, I think. Um, Kotlin does have a few additional functions, which are very nice, which is extension functions, which work very nicely with Oryx Java. Uh, so for example, let's see what I did first here. The first one, throttle first. This is a function we use in, in the apps I work on throughout the app. So instead of typing that out every time, we, we just have an extension function, say, filter rapid clicks. And we set the time, and we over time figured out what is the ideal time, and then there's one time throughout the app that uses exactly the same filter. Um, also, we usually just log the error automatically. So I wrote that, subscribe and log E. So now you don't have to go pass the, the logging function every time. And if you want to keep a running tally of anything in the app, you can just say tally clicks, and this is like an extension function. If you want to see this example, this is in the code I linked in the beginning and will at the end as well. Oh, yeah. Um, sometimes, Oryx Java, you don't want to get into it, but sometimes this is the best way. So you just have to kind of get, get forced into it, no matter what. Think of that as Kotlin coroutines. Yes, Kotlin coroutines is great but you need to get into Oryx Java as well if you want to do a slightly more complex things. Um, I'm going to go through one more example now just to show how easy the thread switching is. So in this case, it's difficult to see in the animation, but uh, there's no threading button. If you have a long-running operation and you do it on the UI thread, you'll see the button kind of, it, it doesn't behave nicely. It, it sticks, and if you try and do other things in the UI thread, it doesn't behave nicely, whereas the good threading one it immediately switches the thread, does things in the background, and then puts it back on the UI thread. So if you were to do this in code, that in Oryx Java would be this. If there's a click event, you set the text, and get random number is the uh, thing that takes a long time to load, so that like fakes a, a computationally heavy operation. Uh, but we want to do more than that. We need to switch a thread, so we observe on computation thread. Easy. One liner to just switch thread. Unfortunately, this will crash because this is on the UI thread and demands anything that touches it to be on the UI thread. So you need to do this. Put it on the computation thread, then get the random number, which passes it down, puts it on the main thread again, and passes that value to text view. And so easy thread switching. You don't have this callback owl where everything starts getting nested, nested, nested. It's easy to just switch between the threads in, in just one line. Uh, so just in animation form. Uh, 
Again, the, the official documentation says this. What does that mean? What is orange? But uh, if you see it in animation, it makes a little bit more sense. So this is the one thread. This is the background thread, the main thread and the background thread. And all this thing does is it switches it, gets a random value, and puts it back. Fairly simple. OK, and then this one, which I'm quite proud of. That thing updates a list 144 times per second. I'm not a console peasant, so I'm not doing it at just 30. Um, and that's, that's about as fast as you can see, like generally, for small changes. And despite the fact that there is a string being updated throughout the list 144 times per second, there's no real UI speed uh, slowdown. Maybe if you're on an older phone, you can show me. I, I want to see like, how slow this thing gets. But this thing is fairly optimized. And how would you normally do this? How would you go about passing this identical string to all of the items in the list? It's quite an operation. So with Oric Java, it's, it's actually fairly simple. Actually, no. It's, even with Oric Java, it's complex. But it's a lot simpler in Oric Java than it would be otherwise. Because normally, without Oric Java, I would think, do I iterate through the list? Do I pass this listener? How do I do the memory management? I can give you the first part, which is uh, Oric Java has this very nice function called interv interval. So every seven milliseconds, pass one to the scan function, which adds up the total, and sends it to the text publisher. And this text publisher is another Oryx Java observable. And this thing is being observed by each item in this list. And every time this thing gets an update, it passes this, this string, this text, to, to this publisher, and everything that's watching this publisher, each of the items in this list, is getting this update. If you want to uh, see more, please go see for yourself, because I have this code working very nicely with a lot of comments on the GitHub repo. Documentation. So this is both for this presentation as well as if you want to get into Oryx Java or if you want to expand your Oryx Java knowledge. Go there. This is Oryx, the Oryx starter repo on GitHub. Uh, it's got on the readme a bunch of essential links that I think people should use. Uh, so, okay, let's see. Mostly background information. This one is definitely the best one. Frugio's Intro to Oryx Java, which is a very extensive guide. But again, you just want to start using examples. You don't want to do everything, know all, it, all of the stuff just to do a few simple examples, which is why I put together a list of simple examples. These are the things that I think are good to know about for a beginner-ish person, someone getting into Oryx Java to know about, to create observables. And then there's a long list of operators that I think, if you want to start getting into Oryx Java, that you want to know about. Yes, the most important ones. That is absolutely crazy. That is way too much. And I, I do mean it. These were, I, I just put together a list of the most beginner ones, and all of this came out. So I tried to simplify it even more. And I came down to this two to create an observable. This one is just a short-ish list of good operators to start with, more or less, and play around with. And so I have a list of these operators on that repo that I want you to please check out, this one here. And in there, they all link to an activity which is one of the clickable items in the app. And then it shows how to use them. Uh, hopefully, that helps you out. 
Uh, just a few final thoughts. Oryx Java is extremely powerful and difficult to get into. And a few people have asked me about architecture components as well as coroutines, the Kotlin coroutines, about whether that doesn't replace Oryx Java's functionality. And the answer is Oryx Java has this much, fun fun this much functionality and about like a third of the most popular usage has been replaced by Kotlin coroutines and the architecture components of Android and live data and all of those things. Uh, but the problem is those things are the things that make it easy to get onto Oryx Java, just simple thread switching. So what, which, what this means is that Kotlin coroutines and architecture components took away the simple parts of Oryx Java usage. So it's going to get, if you use those things, more difficult to get into Oryx Java. Um, but that being said, Kotlin coroutines are great and the live data and the architecture components, all of those things are great, and you should use them if you just want the simple solution. If you want this massive thing, this is a two meg library, which is actually quite a lot, if you think about it, uh, of just functions and operators. And, uh, but if you use this repo, it should be easier than anything else I've seen online to get into Oryx Java and start using the app and everything. So, yeah, that is everything from me. Yeah. Uh, Akka. Akka. I have not. I don't even know it. How can I look for it? Is it AKA? -A Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, I was the last person to get into Oryx Java on my team. Uh, the company, th this is why, yeah, there, flat circle. The company I work at, uh, they are extremely quick to adopt and uh, mostly senior people. But I do understand that it makes it difficult. So we, we're getting junior people now. And usually we have to kind of sit next to him and just explain some of the basic stuff. But if you, you don't use Oryx Java everywhere, and if you do use it, you try and use it in simple patterns. It's the same rules that apply for any programming framework applies for Oryx Java, but doubly so in terms of readability. You need to be very careful about how you do it. And that is a drawback, but uh, it, because it's so powerful, most people are willing to accept that drawback, especially if you have a team like at Flat Circle where the people are tending towards more seniors. Yeah. The, I would say the biggest cost I've noticed, I haven't done a full Analysis, I do actually want to, but um, the biggest cost I've, I've noticed is the, the amount of functions and the compile time and the, uh, the, the two megs that it adds and that, but the library itself actually helps you reduce your you know, uh, runtime uh, issues and uh, it makes it easier to do memory management and keep the memory low and thread switch and so on. So it actually helps do everything better at runtime, but it's more difficult at compile time. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, Oryx Android is only a library on top of Oryx Java, and that only adds one or two functions, mainly, uh, I have it up here actually. Okay, it's going to go too much far back, but the Android scheduler dot main thread, where it makes sure as you get on the main thread, that's the main thing, the main feature that Oryx Android adds, uh, because the thread pool is something that's threads don't matter that much on like generic Java or backend Java thing, but on Android, which one of the UI thread is matters a lot. So that's the only reason that Oryx Android really exists.
I think. Uh, you're at the back. This. Test observable, test observer, and blocking observable. Or blocking observer. One of those two. Um, the thing is, like, I'm not that good with unit testing Android because it's really difficult. But I can tell you that Oryx Java at least doesn't make it more complex because it does provide these tools in, included in the core library. That means that you can say, okay, fake send these, mock, mock out this data or pretend to receive this data. Uh, 